Welcome to Casual Friday. So I want to start off by uh, sharing with you some, some knitting related things that I have seen online this week. Then I'm going to talk about my new vintage sweater project that is currently in progress. And I'm going to answer some questions that I get a lot that are related to what I do in the course of knitting a project that has to do with my charting software and the spreadsheets that I use. And then I want to talk a little bit about World War I knitting because I've been doing a lot of reading about that since uh, the, the pattern that I've chosen is, a, is from that era. And I've got, gotten curious about knitting at that time and been exploring a range of newspaper articles and websites and videos and a variety of things that I want to share with you as well. So let's get started. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen this show up in your feed in the past couple of weeks. It was a New York Times article about a woman, she's a physicist, who is, she's also a knitter and she's using the structure of knitting to sort of inform some, a five-year project that she's working on that has to do with understanding how knitting interconnects and allows some allows the fabric to be stretchier in some places or more uh, less stretchy in others and she's using a lot of theoretical stuff to go along with that because that information could you could be helpful in biomedical um, uses so i talked about her i mentioned that a brief article about her a few months ago but this one is more in depth and it's it's pretty interesting so i'm going to leave links down below to the Articles and websites and videos that I talk about today are all going to be down in the website below or down in the description below. So the next thing was an article I saw in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> you can read it and decide what you think. It, it, it discusses knitting as the new yoga, which kind of bugged me because they've been saying that for at least 15 years, if not longer. So I'm not sure why it's all of a sudden it's the new yoga, but it's an interesting article and about how knitting is coming into businesses as a way to help it's stressed out employees learn to um, sort of meditate because they've discovered that meditation and yoga and, and knitting can all put the brain in a very similar state that allows you to feel calmer and less stressful. So I'll leave that down in the, in the description as well. Then I saw a video this week and I'm not sure where I saw the link to it. I was reading something uh, some article somewhere that linked to this video on YouTube and I watched it and I thought it was pretty interesting. It's, it's called The Secret Life of Knitting. And there were interviews with a lot of pretty well-known people in the knitting community like Amy Singer who publishes Knitty, Kate Atherley was in there, Franklin Habit, um, Debbie Stoller who wrote Stitch and Bitch Nation, uh, there are quite a few well-known people that were interviewed for this video and I went to get the link for it so that I could share it with you and I saw that the video is what what is called on YouTube unlisted. That means it's available for the public to see if they have a link to it but you can't search for it on YouTube. It won't show up in in any search results. I'm not sure why they did that, but so I'll leave that link um, down below as well. It's pretty interesting. It's about 45 minutes long. It had some, a variety of things that they were talking about um, in the history of knitting and just current knitting and trends and things like that. And one of the things that, that I, that was my aha moment was how I decided recently that when I was going to do this uh, project where I knit a sweater from each decade starting at, at the beginning of the 20th century, I really wasn't completely sure how far into the century I was going to go. But I, you know, I find things interesting all the way up through the 1950s. And so I, I even found a pattern from 1959 that I like that I, I may end up knitting unless I find something else from the 50s that I like better. But I really, once I hit the 60s, I thought, I, I don't feel like I want to knit anything past this point. And I thought that it was because I had lived through that time period. So I was born in 1962. And so when I look at these pictures of people, you know, wearing these items, 
it just feels like a childhood memory to me. So it doesn't, it doesn't feel vintage to me. So I was thinking, well, maybe that's, that's why. So I really don't want to knit anything from the sixties or seventies because I don't like it because it looks dated to me. It doesn't look vintage. It looks dated. And then I learned to knit in the eighties. So to me, you know, I've already covered um, the end of the century that way, but this secret life of knitting video was talking about sort of the trends in knitting throughout the century and then how in the 60s and 70s knitting and crocheting kind of kind of had a downward trend and they were attributing that to the kind of pretty awful yarns that were available and just the the awful patterns like there was nothing that was appealing about those, if you look at those patterns, they're ugly. So it isn't just that, oh, I lived through it and I saw it and I think it looks dated and I don't want to do it. It's, you know, it's ugly. <laughs> so, so that's, that's, uh, where I'm probably going to finish my vintage knitting is, um, at 1960. I, t I told you last week that about how I came upon this pattern that I'd seen this pattern booklet from 1918 and then it was going to, uh, then it's been put in this auction and it was going to be way out of my price range, but I found the, the pattern on Project Gutenberg. And so I have the instructions that it's no problem. And I had discovered that there were many copy, reproduction copies available. That happens a lot of times with these vintage patterns is it's usually an either or thing. Either you can get them free in some sort of digital format or they're available in some sort of reproduction um, copy. So somebody has a copy of it that they've scanned and they've recompiled into a book and they've printed it out and bound it in some way and you can get a copy of it. And I've done that. I've bought a few reproduction copies of old vintage books. And typically when you're going, when you're looking at those, they tell, they show you images of what's in inside. So you can decide, oh, is this a book that I want to buy? These reproduction books usually run somewhere between like 11 or $12 and maybe up to 20. It just depends on how thick they are, how many pages are included. Now, if you're going to buy an original copy of a booklet, Typically, you can also see images of what's included. Like if you were to buy something off eBay, it will show you what the pat the pattern photos, the project photos, they won't show you, you can't read the instructions, but you can at least see what the projects are. But this, this pattern booklet that I had originally found the serviceable sweater in, it was something, it was an antique dealer. He found it in a, in an attic and he was going to sell it. And so he's not, he wasn't showing what was inside. So I went and searched online and I, so I, I was able to get a digital copy free and I could get a reproduction copy if I wanted, which I don't want because I can already have the digital copy. Now it isn't that I don't want an original copy of this sweater pattern because I do think that I am knitting this sweater pattern. It would be really nice to have an original copy of it. But, and I didn't want to buy a reproduction copy of it. It would be either be the real copy or just, or just stay with the digital. So I, I noticed that these reproduction copies were being sold by a number of different sellers. And I thought that's a lot of people selling reproduction copies of this particular pattern. That makes me think that it may actually be available. So I, and I knew that there were a couple of people on Ravelry who had the booklet and said they had the booklet. So it didn't seem like a super rare booklet to me. So I went on eBay and I looked for it. And the first couple of hits were reproduction copies. And then they were booklets that had nothing to do with this particular booklet. And I kept scrolling down and I found one. I saw that it was a photograph of the actual cover and I read the description carefully to make sure that it wasn't a, a digital copy of this, that it was the original copy. And it was. And so the difference between buying this one and buying a reproduction copy on eBay was that the reproduction copies, they have an un potentially unlimited number of copies and they just have a selling price. And the selling price all over the internet for reproduction copies ranged from about $8 to $16, depending on where you're trying to buy it from and who you were buying it from. The original copy that I found on eBay was not, did not just have a, a for sale price on it. It was, it was in an auction because it's a one, 
unit only copy. Like it is the original copy. There aren't any others. And so it was in an auction where the minimum bidding price was $11.99 and there were no bidders on it yet. And the auction was going to close in two days. So I put $11.99 bid on it and I waited two days and I won the auction. So I don't have to pay a hundred Canadian dollars or more in order to get that booklet that I originally saw. But what's even nicer is the copy that I bought is in really good condition. The cover is perfectly clean and really good condition. The one where I'd originally seen it, the one that's going for over a hundred dollars Canadian, that one has a stained cover and it's crumpled. So the value of that booklet is not that it this handbook of knit and crochet from 1918. It's that this booklet came from a specific house and that's where the interest is in that booklet, which is why I didn't want to buy it. Any day now, I'll be getting my original copy in the mail and I'm really happy about that. So as I mentioned last week, there, there are some there's a big chunk of, of instructions missing from the pattern. So most of the instructions for the cuff are missing, which isn't a big deal because it's ribbing and I can make it however long I want to make it. That's not a big deal. The bigger deal is that this is a shawl collar sweater and the shawl collar is knit separately and I only had the final line of instructions. So I spent the weekend reverse engineering from that line of instructions. And I think I have it figured out from the base of the V up to the shoulders. What goes on at the back of the neck, I'm not 100% sure. I have some ideas uh, and I may experiment in a couple of different ways. So I, th I have that figured out. So Wednesday when I was at Knitting Group, I swatched. I swatched, I knew I could get gauge on a US 6, which is a four millimeter needle. Uh, I didn't know for sure if that's the fabric I wanted for this because it's a longer sweater. It's going around my hips, which means when I sit down, it'll kind of stretch. And I was considering knitting at a tighter gauge in order for the fabric to be a little more resistant to stretching out. So I swatched on a size five and a size six. Now the problem with knitting the sweater on a size five would be that I would have to redo a lot of the calculations uh, for the stitch counts and the row counts. I would have to re-figure all of that out, which would be a lot more work. I compared the, the two fabrics and I really prefer the fabric on a US six. It, the fabric, the stitch pattern is called Mistake Rib and it's really cushy and three-dimensional when it's knit on a size six with the worsted weight yarn. When I knit it on a five, it got flatter and it just, it lost that dimensionality and I just didn't like it as much. So I'm going to cross my fingers and hope this thing doesn't stretch out horribly. Um, but let me show you where I am uh, at the moment. So I'm going to be talking through this headless because the bottom, I started on the back. The instructions actually start with the left front and then the right front. But I wanted to start with the back because it's symmetrical and very simple. There's no shaping. So one of the things that I had to do, this is a 26 inch long sweater. So it's going to definitely come down to my, to, you know, below the fullest part of my hips. So I have a pin right here that marks where 26 inches is from the shoulder of my of my uh, dress form here. What I did was I, when I'd gotten maybe this far, uh, I, I pinned it to the model and I, and I decided, well, where do I want the decrease lines to be? Cause I had added eight extra stitches of, well, two full repeats. And so I needed to figure out where, how I wanted to do the decreases, where I wanted to place them. And so I decided to place them here and here. And I think, it, I think it's going to, to be, fine. So at the moment I've got about 10 inches done on this. I'm um, about 10% completed with the entire sweater. So the yarn that I'm using is a discontinued yarn. I may have bought this eight years ago. It's Elan Peruvian Highland Wool. And it's a yarn that I had used to, it's a mail order company. They don't have, it's not sold in stores. And from what I understand or understood about when I was buying from them pretty regularly was that really the yarns were the same yarns that were being manufactured for some of the name brands, but they were just sold 
at a cheaper price because they had no uh, overhead. They were just selling directly. And the thing that I liked about them was that I could buy a color card. The, the yarn, their wool yarn came in a million colors and I was able to buy a color card so I could actually see what the true colors were. Because I want, at the time I wanted to make a sweater in a very specific kind of uh, color of red and to make an Aran sweater and I couldn't find the color I wanted at the shop near me in Cascade 220 and they didn't have a color card. You could only see colors online and I just didn't trust that. I've, I've had too many <laughs> bad uh, experiences with, with buying color colors online or certainly color combinations online. So I needed to be able to see the color in person. So I, I was able to get the color I wanted and I loved it. Well, what they would do is every fall when they were really ramping up their supplies of the wool yarn, they would have a bag sale. So you would have to buy, these are 50 gram balls of yarn. So there was a bag would have 10, 50 gram uh, balls of yarn in it. And they would sell those at a discount, like maybe even 50% off because they were trying to get rid of the old dye lots before they had the new dye lots come in. And so at that time I bought um, two bags of a couple of different colors and it's been sitting here ever since. <laughs> so this yarn that I got, the color is boysenberry, but I really like Elon. I really liked it. I loved their colors. I love the color selection. I love the actual colors and I really wish that they would uh, sell this again, but I think it was, they saw, stopped selling it at a time when yarn companies were going to superwash wool more and more. And, and I will use superwash once in a while, but I really prefer just standard wool piece. I love the properties that a standard wool has. So one of the things I do when I start a new project is I create a spreadsheet. I go through the pattern line by line, look where the shaping is, where the stitch counts change, and I calculate the total number of stitches uh, running total as I go through the sweater. So then I keep track of how far along I am at any given time. Now this is not a requirement, this is something that I like to do. I keep a project, um, in my project notebook on Ravelry, I always start a project page and I keep notes about what I'm doing and I like to keep my progress up to date on there, like 5%, 10%, whatever. And I don't know how far along I am when I'm using multiple pieces that are in different shapes. I do this for every project, but and I had only ever thought of it in terms of where am I in this project. But over time, as I accumulated spreadsheet after spreadsheet for different projects, I started to realize that I could predict how long a project was going to take based on how many stitches there were. Because I, I also realized, oh, I on average knit about 22 to 2,500 stitches per day. And I just, I know that based on how long it will normally take me to knit a sock and how many stitches are in a sock. I can look at which sweaters only take me three weeks, which is typically my tolerance for working on the same project and only working on that project. So I can look at it and say, oh, this is gonna take me more than three weeks. So I'm gonna have three weeks and then I'll have a break and then I'll finish it up um, some number of months down the line. So I like to kind of have an idea of that before I start. And then I can I can know, oh, I'm this is right on the edge of me being able to complete it in three weeks, but I can probably push through it if I really want to. It also allows me to set goals where I know how many stitches, and if I have a time period I want to finish it in, I know how many stitches per day that I need to, to work on and I know where I am. So for me, it's a way to, pro to track my progress, and it's not something that everybody is going to do. And I did do a fairly in-depth video on this last fall, which I will, you can, I'll link to at the top and you can, uh, look at that one later. There's probably a 20 minute segment in there uh, showing all the different types of spreadsheets I do. Uh, if you don't know how to use a spreadsheet, that's not going to teach you how a spreadsheet works. It's just going to show you how I set this up, assuming you already know how to plug in formulas into a spreadsheet. So the first thing I did when I was looking at this serviceable sweater and trying to, to decide if I was going to knit it, I was reading through it and trying to visualize it as I charted it out. And so a couple of you have asked me about the charting software that I use. And so I thought I'd show you that today. So it's going to be about 15 minutes worth of stuff. So if you don't want to see 
um, anything to do with charting software, you can uh, look at my timestamps below to jump to the next section. I use a program called Stitch Mastery. I'm going to create a new chart diagram. You can also just click on this little icon right here to do this. So this is telling me where I'm going to put this new a file that I'm creating and I could change it by clicking I could put it wherever I wanted and then it's giving me a name right now this is one thing that I was I often forget to name it right away and then it ends up being called default it's some number and then I have to try to figure out where it is so I'm gonna call this uh, cash fry uh, 21 sample like this so right now I am going to establish the chart properties. So if I'm just doing something like charting a stitch pattern, it may not have very many rows and columns. If I'm doing something like charting out the entire back of a sweater, I'm going to do a large number. So right now I'm just going to, I'm going to give it 20 rows and I'm going to give it, uh, I don't know, 30 columns. So then I can choose if I want the column numbers on the top of the chart on the bottom and neither place or in both I like mine at the bottom if I'm doing a very tall chart in a pattern where once you get toward the top it's hard to tell I will do them on both but for a small chart I do not and then I have to decide in my is this for something that's circular or flat the charts gonna look the same if it's flat or circular it's where are the row numbers put so let's do flat and then I can choose is the first row a right side row or wrong side row. I usually leave this as it is until I decide uh, I can change that later in, and determine whether or not it needs to be right side or wrong side row. So and then they, they have um, a choice for mosaic knitting as well when you're knitting flat because those charts are a little bit different. So I finish this and I get this grid showing up and you'll see that these are square you can set the proportions to be not square so that would be something that you'd want to do if you were doing an intarsia pattern where the stitches are going to be more rectangular and the picture that you're creating with color is going to be affected by the size of the stitch but the symbols really fit well in the square and so unless I'm really needing to see the proportions of something that's color based, I just leave them square. You can change those proportions. Now I like to have the chart be smaller, especially if I have a large number of stitches. So it's at 100% right now. I'm gonna just put it down to 50. A lot of times I'll do something even smaller, but this way I can see my key and I can add more columns and I'll, and I'll still have room over to the right. So over here on the right hand side you have uh, these different folders that have types of stitch types in here. So you have your colors up here if you, and you can do custom colors if you want. Uh, basic stitches are here, so knit pearl slipping stitches. You have choices for no stitch boxes, knit, knitting and purling through the back loop and knitting and purling below. And you have different kinds of increases. And this is version three of the program up first and second version knit front back knit front back occupied one square that's how barbara walker first de defined the knit front back symbol back in the 70s and so the increase wasn't ever shown until the second row after that it's the row after when you did the the increase but People have commented that they really want the knit front back to take up two squares so that you can you can see at the end of the row how many stitches you have on your needle and it, and it makes sense. So they have different types of increases, purl increases as well, yarn over increases, um, different types of decreases. And you can use these and um, you can change the description. Like if you wanted to use a left-leaning decrease and you wanted to say it was SKP or you wanted to call it something else, you could do that. You can change the name of it. So let me just show you quickly. I'm going to say do a little cable pattern that has... Uh, so I'm, I'm drawing purl stitches on here. These are stitches that will appear to be purl stitches on the right side of the work. So I'm just creating some columns here. And then I'm gonna come down, I'm gonna choose four stitch cables. So there's all different kinds of symbols. So you have 
two stitches crossing, two stitches to the right, two over two to the left, two over two where the two in the back are pearls. And so you see the little pearl symbol there. This one is one stitch crossing in front of three stitches to the right or the left. And then this one has with pearl stitches in the back. This is three crossing over one. Again, you have the pearl versions. Then you have a version where you have one crossing where it's two stitches in the center remain where they are and then the outer ones are crossing right or left over them. So all every kind of version that you can imagine. And here we start getting into the twisted stitches. Um, and again, every, every version. And then she's got a four stitch custom cable that you can just use an X. But you can also customize your own cable patterns and create and add little, the, the, she calls these embellishments, these little bits that appear on the symbol. So you could, you can create your own symbols if you want to. So I'm going to pick just a two, two over two right cross. And I'm going to decide, well, which right side row do I want to put it on? This is a right side row, row three. And so I'm going to put it here and I'm going to do it uh, every four rows all the way up. So you just click on them and, and you can create them. And then I could, I could do some uh, lace pattern at the same time. Maybe I want to uh, do something with yarn overs like this. And then I use a knit decrease. And maybe I want to use a knit two together after. But you can play with it. You can kind of get an idea what things are going to look like. If I wanted these cables to travel, for example, I could do a three stitch cable maybe. So I would want at this point, I'm going to get rid of this right here. Maybe I want these uh, and maybe I don't want it. I want this. So I'm moving that purl stitch over there. So I'm going to keep making this travel across here. Oh, this one needs to move. So I can create something, I can, I can just add these and move things around, make things bigger, make them smaller. So that's how I create a chart. So let me show you a chart that I created for the serviceable, serviceable sweater that I'm knitting right now. So I'm going to shrink this really small so you can get a better sense of what I've got here. So. What I started with down here was the garter stitch edging. And I could not tell from the pattern whether the first row was a right side row or a wrong side row. And um, so I couldn't tell for that. And, and for the back, it probably doesn't really matter. Now I added an extra eight stitches to the back to accommodate uh, my hips. That, and so here, here is what I've, I've done to plan for the decreases. I put this yellow line here so I could find the center and then count uh, repeats over and then and then get that placed correctly. From this point on where I have the blue line, everything is going to stay the same. I, the stitch pattern is established. It's just one big rectangle. This is the actual width of the fabric as it occurs at this point. That is a mistake right there. Which I will fix right there. Okay, so once I get at, up to the, where the armholes are, this is how wide this actually is. So I have just created this line here because I don't need to chart that all out. And I wanted to just see how the shaping for the back was going to be. And then I charted out the short row shaping. There's some decreases here, which is why I ended up with some shading right here. Um, so this is what the back armholes look like. 
So let me show you what the front looks like. Let me do this smaller. I don't have the entire front charted out. Uh, what I have is the establishing the base of the sweater down at the bottom with the garter stitch and getting the stitch pattern established. This orange thing is where the pocket is going to be. So I was trying to decide ahead of time, where am I going to place the pocket? Because this is also a pattern where I'm going to add four stitches. I'm going to add a full repeat that I'm going to decrease out at some point. And I wanted the decreases to occur someplace away from the pocket. So I, I wanted to, first of all, find where that pocket should be. And I'm not completely sure I'm going to put it here yet. I need to kind of measure on myself, like where would my hands naturally go? And, and I want the pocket to go there. And so I might be adjusting this one way or the other, I'm not sure. Um, but then the decreases that I'm going to have to put in are going to be over here somewhere. So again, I, I don't have a blue line going across this way, but again, there's gonna be a lot of just plain straight up above the pocket and before the, uh, v-neck shaping and before the armhole shaping. There's just going to be a lot of continuing to, to knit the same thing. So I didn't chart all of that. But I did want to see how the v-neck shaping worked and understand that these two stitches were maintained in garter stitch the entire time and then gradually that the decreases just encroached in on the, the main part of the stitch pattern. And then I charted out the underarms to see what they look like. And what's interesting about the very top is that as you get toward the top, there's some knit front back increases that cause this to get a little bit wider at the top. And that surprised me. The bind off rate is different for the front than it is for the back. On the back, it was four uh, sets of bind off two at each armhole. And this is three, 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 one, one. And then there's some additions at the top. The front is also wider than the back. So... I think that's part of why some of the shaping is occurring. But one of the things I was interested in was finding out for sure whether row one was supposed to be the right side or the wrong side. And I could tell from reading the instructions for this, when it got to this transition point, row 13 starts with the button band instructions. So I knew that it was gonna be a wrong side row because I would be working in this direction. What surprised me was seeing that on the right front, the button band instructions also start on row 13, but I was gonna be knitting in the other direction. And that meant, and what that means is that if row 13 is a wrong side row for one part and a right side row for the other, that means that the garter stitch is not set up the same on each front. And that's something that I wanted to know ahead of time so I could do differently. The buttonholes are also included on the right front. So I wanted to mark, so this is, I actually have much longer because I wanted to um, mark the points for the buttonholes. But I also wanted to make sure that I, that the two fronts actually matched each other in terms of this transition from the garter stitch to the stitch pattern. I wanted it to be a right side knit row for both pieces. So that means that for row 13, I am not starting over here and working in this direction like the patterns instruct. Instead, I'm gonna start over here and work across this way and end the row with the button band instructions. So I, this is what I get from charting these things out. And the other thing, once I establish the right and wrong side, then I can decide how I'm gonna have a selvage stitch for my seaming because I want a right side knit column in that selvage to make the seaming easier. I've got a few stray uh, pearl, pearl stitches here, but that's okay. So, um, so this helps me uh, figure things out uh, ahead of time and really visualize what's going on. There's sort of different types of software that do different things that are helpful when you are either designing a sweater or charting stitch patterns or whatever. So Stitch Mastery is a, an application that allows you to chart stitch patterns. Now, I also use it to 
to do sort of the outline uh, using my stitch patterns and, and outlining with the decreases and shaping and stuff, what an entire pattern piece is going to look like. For me, that's not really its intent, but that's how I use it, one way that I use it. There used to be software, and I don't know that there's any that is still being supported, but I've had software over the years. I had one that was called Design Init that I bought when I bought a knitting machine 20 some years ago. So that, and it would, and it worked very similarly to how another pa uh, program called Sweater Wizard worked, where you say you wanna knit a sweater, you say if it's a cardigan or a pullover, you select the type of neck that you want, what size it's going to be, what kind of sleeve you want set in, raglan, all that kind of stuff. And you're choosing the dimensions and you can alter that if you want. If you want to make an alteration, make something longer or shorter or slightly bigger around or a V-neck a little bit deeper, you can customize things, you could that way. And it would create this schematic for you. And in the case of Sweater Wizard, it would give you a basic outline of the sweater. You would have to know your gauge that you were going to use and what stitch front you would select. You would have selected that, but it allowed you to do things like uh, knit sweaters without having to buy a pattern specifically for somebody that had the stitch patterns you want. You could pick your stitches out of a stitch dictionary, do your gauge swatches, um, and do all of that, and then it would put it would print out a basic pattern for you um, that you could follow and, and knit the thing. Before we had these computer programs like Stitch Mas Mastery, which has these menus of charting symbols, before that you really had to do charting using keyboard um, symbols. And so that was a lot harder to do uh, charts in those days, but things like Stitch Mastery allow you to create these beautiful charts. But before you had that, if you wanted a really professional looking chart that looks like the kind that you can do easily with Stitch Mastery, you would have to use a program like Adobe Illustrator and basically build your own symbols and you create a library of symbols that you had built and that you could then use in your own charts. So it's a very different process than what Stitch Mastery is. There's different kinds of, of programs to do that. And then if you want to create a pattern that's going to have a nice layout and design where you have your charts and you have your instructions and your photographs and all that, that's different kind of software altogether as well. So these, there's not one program that will allow you to design a sweater and create um, a printable pattern or anything like that. You have to have these different components that allow you to do these different things. You may not need that if you just want to chart some stitch patterns and print those out on your home printer and use those while you're knitting your project. So it really depends on what you need and what you're trying to do, which kind of software uh, works for you. As part of this knitting this particular sweater, I've been really reading through a lot of vintage patterns and I've been reading a lot about World War I knitting. And one of the things that I came across, I think it was, it was somebody in the comments of my video either last week or the week before, it was probably last week, mentioned a video that was put on by the World War, the National World War I Museum in, I think they're in Kansas City or St. Louis, they're in Missouri. They uh, had this video that's called Mrs. W Wilson's Knitting Circle, and they were presenting information. They invited people to come for this presentation about World War I knitting, and they had a ton of people come, so they were in an auditorium, and they videotaped it, and so they gave a presentation about uh, knitting during World War I, and people that were in the audience could be knitting at the time, and they were providing a pattern that people um, could knit that was from World War I. Um, from the Red Cross knitting and then they, they, they talked about what the knitting was like and so I was knitting to that the other day when I, on my sweater while I was watching that and then they mentioned something that I had heard before but hadn't connected it to World War I and that was that the socks that were being knit for soldiers that there is the way we graft sock toes today we call the Kitchener stitch they were mentioning that it was named for Lord Kitchener. And I had heard that before, that, that the Kitchener stitch was named after this, this uh, army general or commander or something, but I didn't realize it was World War I. And 
I thought, well, that's weird. I thought, you know, people were grafting toes. They've been making socks for, you know, a thousand years. It's, it's the reason humans started knitting was because the advantage that knitting had over weaving was that you could make a stretchy form-fitting stocking. And it's one of the first things that got mechanized during the Industrial Revolution was sock knitting. And I thought, surely they'd been grafting long before that. I didn't think he invented grafting. I knew that grafting had been invented before that. I just hadn't realized it hadn't been used on sock toes. So I started looking at these old patterns and I realized they were using the three needle bind off on the inside of the sock, or they were using techniques for decreasing the toes that are very similar to a hat crown where you're getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you just have a few stitches and then you fasten that off like a drawstring and tighten it up that way. Uh, but those were the two methods that were used and I was really surprised by that. <laughs> there are a lot of articles and websites that talk about Kitchener and how, and he's credited with grafting the sock toe which didn't really quite sound right to me. And that a lot of them hedge, hedge that statement by saying, well, we don't have any proof. And we're not sure if he was a knitter or if he was just commissioning a knitter to come up with it. He was really concerned about the soldiers whose feet were really suffering because it was a trench warfare and they were wet all the time. And if they were marching, they're wearing through their socks. And it turns out that a pair of socks was only lasting a couple of weeks. So, and then if they had to actually march for 60 miles or something, the socks were done at the end of that march. So they were going through socks like crazy. And so there was this craze to just try to keep the soldiers in their, in socks and, and to make them as comfortable as possible. So there had been complaints. It seems that um, people were, that, that the socks weren't as comfortable as they could be and, and people were really trying to come up with uh, ways of making them more comfortable. And it's really not clear where this concept of the graft to toe came from. So I did a search the other night and just on newspapers.com because it's part of my Ancestry uh, subscription, just to see if there's any information in the papers at the time of the war that would indicate Kitchener's involvement with the grafted sock toe. And I don't have all of the answers, but I do have some answers that I thought were really interesting. First, there was an article that appeared in 1918 that states that it was the Canadians who came up with this grafted toe and that they named it the Kitchener toe in his honor. Now Kitchener died in 1916. So the earliest examples of this toe, like an actual pattern with it, includes this toe is in 1917. But in 1916, there was a little piece in the Vancouver newspaper that told people to come, there was gonna be a demonstration of the new Kitchener toe. So they're not saying what the Kitchener toe was. I assume that it was the grafted toe, but I don't have evidence that, that that's what it was. It does lend some credence to the idea that the Canadians came up with this kind of toe. And then I found an article that from fall of 1915 that was in a newspaper in Kansas, of all places, that mentioned a Mrs. Matilda Cox who had come up with a really comfortable sock and it, she was um, being admired in all of the newspapers and uh, she decided to name it the Kitchener sock in his honor. Again, no information about what was special about the sock, what was different about it. I can't find anything in any of the British newspapers that refer to this. So I'm gonna keep looking, but um, I did also find some mention in some newspaper articles about people complaining about, they wish that the Kitchener toe had never been invented because it was so hard to learn. So, which I thought was funny because people complain about that today. But in my efforts to track down when uh, the grafted toe, I came upon a knitting manual. Well, it's not really a knitting manual. It's um, 
It's a manual about garment making and things that was aimed at children that were at this uh, school in England. And I think it's called the Finchley School. And they had this series of manuals and it was for girls and boys to teach them literacy, but also to teach them specific skills that would make them good to be employed as servants, uh, amongst other things. There's a, I'll put a link down below. There is a, a guy who spoke about this particular school and um, these schools, these industrial schools they were referred to as, and in, and in particular about these manuals. There was some on gardening and cooking and all kinds of things. But the, the one that is on like shirt making and garment mending includes a section on knitting. And within the section of an, on knitting, the whole thing is in like this question answer format. And as if uh, somebody is interviewing or testing um, somebody and says, well, there are several good ways of grafting. Can you tell me uh, one of those ways? And then the per the yes, ma'am, I can. And they answer, well, one way is to do this. And I was trying to imagine this in my head. I'm like, what are they saying to do? And, and I'm like, how is that going to work? And so I, I practice on a little swatch and I think my brain almost exploded. It is the most ridiculously easy way to graft a sock toe. Only this book was not was not promoting it as a way to graft a sock toe. It was promoting it as a way to mend socks. So it was recognized as a, a, that it seems like grafting was used as a mending technique. And for some reason, nobody, it didn't occur to anybody to use this as a way to close openings when you were actually knitting. And I'm not sure why that would be, but Clearly there are these instructions for grafting that are amazingly, ridiculously simple. And I'm gonna do Technique Tuesday on this because I can't believe how easy this is. And then the second method was a little harder for me to understand and eventually I figured out what they were getting at. Just, I was amazed at this, but I'm even more amazed that, that grafting hadn't been used in sock toes uh, prior to World War I. That really astounds me. The final thing that I have noticed about World War I knitting, when I was looking for something to knit from World War I, I didn't feel like there were a lot of patterns out there and I didn't feel like they were very interesting. And I did notice that in just about every pattern book, there also it was included patterns uh, that were for the soldiers. So anything that was printed during that time also included patterns for socks and balaclavas and scarves and all kinds of things that would keep soldiers warm were included in these booklets. But there weren't a lot. It wasn't a huge variety. They weren't that interesting. They were pretty plain, the sweaters. And I I wasn't sure if it was a, if it was just that moment in time that where the clothes seemed pretty drab compared to um, to the 1920s, where it where it's amazing. I can't wait to knit the stuff from the 1920s. I was just thinking, oh, it's probably because so much knitting was focused on the war effort. Maybe that's why there weren't that many patterns. That that's just what I had as a thought. What's interesting though is how perhaps it's non-knitters who are interpreting this. It could be the people who are discussing the history of World War I and knitting are not really avid knitters or maybe they haven't, <laughs> they haven't been looking for vintage sweaters to knit that are interesting. Um, but what they were saying was that there was this huge interest in knitting during World War I and then once the war was over, people put away their knitting needles and knitting really dropped out, dropped down. People just weren't doing it anymore in the 1920s. My interpretation of it is there was an interest in knitting in terms of producing products that would be useful for the soldiers. So that's where the interest in knitting was. Everybody was knitting. They were knitting in public. It was your patriotic duty to be knitting for the soldiers. In the 1920s, the people who had been knitting for the war effort and weren't necessarily that interested in knitting otherwise had, had were done with it. But what happened was that's when knitting got interesting. The knitting patterns in the 1920s 
are really interesting. They're creative. They have uh, dressmaking design elements in them. There's a huge variety. They're gorgeous. And I really can't wait to knit them. There was this huge shortage of wool in World War I because it was being used for the soldiers' uniforms and for the soldiers' socks and that sort of thing. And women were really looked down on for doing any personal knitting. And, you know, there's articles in the newspaper about how you can take, you can rip out last year's sweater and then re-knit it into something else. You could dye the, you could dye the yarn and re-knit it, or you could dye the sweater and then add some, some new embellishments to make it new. Uh, and, and what things that you could do to sort of save on wool, make it a little bit shorter. But the, there was a real uh, concern about, about not wasting those resources, but that is not really a reflection on on what was going on with people who were actually knitters. And I mean process knitters. Knitters who enjoy the act of knitting and want to create things that are fun and interesting to knit. The World War I knitting was a virtuous thing. It was showing your patriotism. That does not mean it was interesting. If I was knitting nothing but, but army socks in khaki green for four years, I would be sick of that as well. I would be a relief to not have to do that anymore. So if you weren't a real knitter, like you didn't really enjoy knitting, of course you're gonna put it to the side once the war was over. But if you were a knitter who was relieved that they didn't have to knit those anymore because now you can knit for yourself and now the you know wool was going to be in supply again, you could, you could knit things in different colors and the, and the choices of what you could knit for yourself would have just exploded. So even, it, it's just a, a really different perception in my mind of what was going on in that transition period from World War I to the 1920s in terms of knitting. Well, that's it for this week. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.